It's not changing anything about uh, the way the investment teams are operating and the way most of our organization is operating. We, so the additional CPP will get the full power and expertise of, uh, of overall what CPPIB does. Uh, and then what we're doing is we're mixing uh, it with a very low risk return portfolio to provide the lower risk uh, that's required for that additional CPP portfolio. So they'll, they'll get all the benefits and a little bit of a lower risk uh, uh, profile because, um, because of the nature of uh, the fact the additional CPP has to be fully funded. Uh, but um, so that, that, that's the way we're operating it today. The profile of your investments have changed dramatically over time, right, from government bonds uh, to a huge uh, reliance on, on exposure in Canada, now truly global across asset classes. Will it continue to evolve? Are there some asset classes you look at for the long term and think we're going to have fewer equities down the road and more private equity? What's the mix going to be? Yeah, so it's actually so we're going to publish our annual report next week, and uh, and there's a page in there that lists out what we call our strategic portfolio, which is where we want to be in the longer term. And if you look at that, the things that are going to grow um, will be our real assets portfolio will grow, our credit portfolio will grow, our fixed income appetite will grow. Actually, pub public equities will continue to come down gradually. Private equity doesn't move that much uh, over time. We've already got a substantial uh, private equity portfolio. So it's more sort of credit fixed income and real asset exposure that's going to grow as a percentage of the portfolio over time. There are calls, of course, over time that uh, the fund, because it's Canadian and for Canadian pensioners, should be targeted in specific ways. Uh, there's a new one from a, a member of parliament suggesting that you should uh, invest ethically, uh, that there should be parameters about what kinds of companies you can invest in. Uh, what are your thoughts about that kind of call? Well, I'd say two things. First of all, uh, we take um, ethical investing, sustainable investment, uh, and you know the ESG, uh, you know the environment, social, and governance responsibilities, very seriously. Um, and we, you know, we have done for many years. Uh, having said that, you know, I think one of the things that's made uh, you know, CPP uh, and CPPIB you know, so successful over the last 20 years is keeping it arm's length from politics and you know, prevailing politics. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we are, our, our investment strategy is completely arm's length from any uh, political influence. Um, and I think that that's stood the test of time really well and uh, allowed us to make really uh, professional judgments about what's the right thing to invest in and how and to really interpret that mandate which is to maximize returns without undue risk. Uh, and so I think uh, you know, it's been a huge success story for Canada. I think it's benefited the 20 million Canadians really well. And I think that, that arm's length uh, mandate is uh, something that you know, I, I, I would recommend that Canadians continue. And it's, be, it's been the envy of the world as I, as I go around the world looking at other pension systems and the problems that they have uh, around the world. And just in terms of the risks that you do see, uh, obviously as a, a pension fund, you have a serious long-term obligation um, to capital preservation. No sign of any trouble, uh, according to the actuary, but when you think about the long-term and what you worry about, what's on the list? I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't worry about the sustainability of the fund. This is, the fund is going to be, uh, you know, is, is going to be sustainable. Money will be there for when people retire. Uh, it, it's, uh, I think the chief office, the chief actuary, does uh, fantastic work in, in uh, showing the long-term projections, demographics, you know, workforce participation, longevity, etc. So. The, the, so from that point of view, I think we're, you know, Canada's in wonderful shape. When, when I look at the sort of medium term outlook for performance of assets, uh, I, you know, I, I do worry about this rise in geopolitical tensions. Um, you know, I worry in particular between the first and second largest economies in the world. Uh, you know, as we talked about, and how that can ripple through every other economy. So, you know, it, it will impact you know economies like Germany, which have been teetering on the brink of recession, uh, given you know the importance of uh, you know of, of the U.S. and China to their export markets, uh, and you know, and, and so on and so on. So that that's something that you know we've got to watch very carefully and uh, you know, make sure we navigate around. Where where are global debt levels on the list of concerns? You know, they're up there. I mean, global debt levels are somewhere around $247 trillion of debt uh, across lots of 
you know, every possible different category and, uh, you know, whether it's government debt or private sector debt or personal debt, and it's been accumulating around the world. Now, it, 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 it's sort of fine and serviceable at extremely low interest rates as we have right now. And maybe, you know, these global tensions will keep interest rates low for, lower for longer. Uh, but it, but it, you know, that that's something that is, uh, you know, that's pulling prosperity forward uh, from the future um, to now. Uh, so, you know, the generation, you know, that is, you know, we've been living through has spent that money that ultimately should get paid back at some point uh, in the future. Uh, and uh, you know, so it, so it's it's a concern and something that that we watch is more likely to be just a drag on growth rather than to precipitate any crisis. Uh, but it will be a drag on growth going forwards. We saw how your fund performed uh, in the uh, end of last year and massive market volatility. The mix protected you from uh, the, you know the worst downside. I, th I think is is your intention. Because yep. you're overshooting by so much, um, the actuarial requirements, you know, 4% uh, above inflation is what's needed. You're running at 11%, um, so let's call that 9%. Uh, could you actually change the mix to be even more careful? Um, I know that seemed, yeah. may seem like a strange question to ask an investment manager, yeah. but sh should we be a little, uh, a little more boring? Yeah, I let that comment go a couple of times. Now, now you've mentioned it a third time head on. Let, let me address that one because, you know, it's not... Our, our, um, what we're asked to do is maximize returns without undue risk. We're not asked just to meet that minimum uh, that's required for mm -hmm. sustainability of, of the fund. And there's lots of other factors. The reason why we should maximize returns is that there's lots of other factors that could happen that could affect that long-term sustainability. You know, if, if, uh, you know if, if, if Google X and others get their way, if Alphabet get their way and you know, longevity substantially increases and uh, uh, you know, cancer is cured forever and uh, you know, people are living to 150, uh, you know, that, that's going to have a profound implications on pension systems. Take an extreme example. Uh, but there's many other factors that could affect uh, the sustainability of the fund. Now, our job is to build up as you know, much cushion, if you will, as possible so, uh, so governments, the governments across the country can decide whether uh, to use that to keep, keep that cushion for those unexpected impacts in the future mm -hmm. or, or uh, whether they want to increase benefits or reduce contributions in the future and put more money back in the economy. So, but that, that, that's, that's our job is to maximize returns without undue risk. So we, we'll continue with that objective of running what we think is a prudent risk level in order to ma and try to maximize returns at that level of risk. All right, and another question I know you'll like um, is just to defend for us the fees, uh, the, the fees that you pay obviously here, but also to outside managers at a billion and a half a year. Are we getting a good return on those investments? Yeah, most importantly, all of the returns I've mentioned are net of all of those fees and expenses. Uh, so the 8.9% for the year, the 11.1% for 10 years is net of all of those fees and expenses. That's the first thing. Secondly, we keep the operating expenses uh, very tightly controlled. It's around 32 basis points, which is how it's been over the last few years. And third, those fees we pay to external managers, we keep a uh, you know, very tight squeeze on those, and they're actually declining slightly as a percentage of the assets under management. And you see this year our performance fees came down as uh, some of the, you know, the hedge funds that were invested in their performance came down this year. Uh, over the five years they performed really well, but they, you know, they had a tricky time in the, in the, uh, the fourth quarter of last year, last calendar year. Uh, and so those performance fees came down. If they don't perform, we don't pay them. And uh, so that, that, that's important. So all of these fees and expenses we keep under a, under a tight range. So yeah, we, we believe we get good value for them. I want to ask you, uh, Mark, about SNC Lavalin um, and just the kind of ongoing issues there. Stephen Jaroslawski has raised concerns about the sale of that 407 stake. Uh, is your view changed at all about investing in uh, in Quebec Inc, uh, SNC, or, or other big players that are also, frankly, being targeted on corruption issues? Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to address any specific company or specific situation, um, really. But you know, clearly, we, you know, we're substantial investors across. Across Canada, with substantial investors in infrastructure, we continue to like infrastructure and uh, grow our investments um, across, uh, you know, across the world. And so, uh, you know, that that's you know that that's really all I all I can say. All right, you did uh, though vote against the dual class structure at Bombardier recently. Is that a just an ongoing kind of theoretical view of that structure? 
Yeah, that, that, that's correct. I mean, we, so we, we publish all of our proxy uh, guidelines on, you know, how, how, you know, what guides us on how we're going to vote on, on our website, and you can trawl through all of those. And in there, on dual class uh, shares, it's something that, you know, we believe in, you know, one, one share, one vote, and we think that that's a structure that over the long term serves companies better. Um, and so whenever the, you know, if we, if we uh, have to vote on those types of structures, we'll generally vote against, uh, against those structures.